The Mountbatten's politics were complex. As a serving naval officer and member of the royal family, Dickey always claimed to try and stay above party politics. Edwina's politics were certainly to the left of his. Dining with Edwina in September of 1944, Chips Channon wrote in his diary, However politically, she talked tripe and pretended to be against all monarchy, who she is cousin to every monarch on earth. According to her, they must all be abolished. How easy it seems for a semi-royal millionaire who has exhausted all the pleasures of money and position to turn almost communist. <laughs> what a scathing and yet true line. Hello, how are you? Welcome to another episode of the Mountbatten's. And in this episode, it is called Malta Again. Now, you'll recall that the last time we read, they had just left India and Edwina was really torn up about it. She was leaving the great love of her life and her seeming soulmate in India. And she had really struggled with the parting. Edwina has had a lot of sexual relationships, and the last time that she had somebody that she cared this much about, his name was Bunny, and they had cared about each other a lot to the point that though she was married, when he decided to get married, she really read that in a lot of ways as a betrayal of what they had had together. So then she finds this guy in, in India, Nehru, and while the book does not describe it as the sexual relationship that she had with Bunny, although I'm not saying that didn't happen because I believe that Nehru was actually known as a bit of a womanizer, um, the book emphasizes more their uh, mutual respect for each other, the way that they saw each other as uh, intellectual equals, and they really enjoyed each other's company. And so that was really hard for her to leave. So we've got Dickie being given a new job, uh, is going to be in Malta. So they've got that going on, but Edwina has fallen into a depression and that's really where we pick up on her story. The Mountbatten's arrived in North Hole to be met by Patricia, Prince Philip, Clement Attlee, and the Indian High Commissioner, Krishna Menon. Edwina, still emotional after her parting, made a short speech about what India meant to her. Her young daughter remembered how she began to falter and had difficulty in getting the words out every possible feeling. She stopped, blinked, then licked her lower lip until for a horrifying moment, I thought she might break down. And then as she turned to my father for support, he gave her a warm, confident smile and she regained her composure and found the strength to continue. For Edwina, life in drab post-war London after the vibrancy and energy of India seemed trivial and low-key. She fell into a deep depression, exacerbated by exhaustion and the loss of her beloved terrier, Mizen, who had had to be put down en route to Malta. After the splendors of Government House, 16 Chester Street seemed claustrophobic. Only Broadlands provided the peace that she now needed. She missed the pace of life, the status, the sense of purpose she'd enjoyed in India and tried to replicate it. I have resorted to very hard work as a possible solution to the present situation, she told Neighbor at the beginning of July. It has helped, although it really only a drug. Feeling quite awful, she confided to her diary the following month. General exhaustion and depression, I think. Life is lonely and empty and unreal, she confessed to him. Above all, she missed India and Nehru. She would write to Nehru each day, following Dickie's habit for confidential correspondence of enclosing her letter in a second envelope. At first, this was marked Prime Minister, and later, for himself, numbering each letter so each could be accounted for. Nehru, in turn, would write using the diplomatic bag, Care of, the High Commission. Whereas Dickie's letters had been prosaic, Neighbors were like poetry, indeed often quoting poetry. When no letter was received, like a lovesick teenager, she would call India with the help of half a dozen operators. Okay, just for a real quick pause. It just will never fail to amaze me the way Dicky agrees to help her along in her affairs. I get he's having his own affairs, so that's the only thing I can think of, that because he was engaged in his own behavior, you know, he he couldn't refuse his wife her dilly-dallies. But it just seems like such a weird relationship that you'd be writing to Nehru and then your wife would enclose her letter and another envelope in your letter and you know that you're sending to the Prime Minister a love letter from your wife. I mean, I'm, I'm losing energy to be shocked by it. So I wouldn't say I'm shocked by it anymore. I'm just like, I am continually confounded though. So shock, no. Totally disgusted though, yes. People did what they could to cheer her up. Malcolm Sargent, the old boyfriend, 
took her to see Laurence Olivier in Hamlet. In August, the whole family went to Classy Bond for five days, staying in the local inn, while so they brought the house back to life. The fresh air and peacefulness helped restore her good spirits. Scrambled over the rocks and dabbled in the pools, she wrote to Nehruit, energized. Back by the beach of white sand, brilliant sun and sapphire and multi-emerald colored seas and countryside with its whitewashed thatch cottages. We shrimped off the rocks and sat about in shorts sunbathing. In September, the Mountbattens, with Pamela, stayed with Henry and Yola Letlier in the south of France, where Dickie practiced his water skiing and they saw the Duke of Windsor. Any time Edward comes up, I just have to raise an eyebrow. But Edwina remained dissatisfied. I somehow seem to have grown out of all this, the people, the life, even the scenery, she wrote to Nehru. For Dickie, it was different. Though he had been offered various jobs, including Governor of Malta, Governor General of Canada, and Ambassador to Moscow and Washington, he just wanted to resume his naval career. He put together an eight-page document headed My Next Appointment, which laid out all the possibilities, and he discussed this endlessly with Peter Murphy and Charles Lamb. His two main options were to go to Bermuda as C&C West Indies, generally regarded as a pre-retirement job, or to return to Malta, which might prove politically difficult, given the problems in Palestine, and embarrassing as he would be subordinate to the commander-in-chief. Now sit back for this next little bit. Weissel, Mountbatten had received praise for the transfer of power. It had come at a price. Dickie recollected how, shortly after their return, Churchill came up to him at Buckingham Palace reception and said, What you did in India? It's as though you struck me across the face with a riding whip. And he turned his back on me, and he didn't speak to me for several years. Scathing words from Churchill. Mountbatten, however, continued to take an interest in the subcontinent, especially as many issues from his time played out after his return. We hard to turn your back on that after you'd been so entrenched in it. On September 11th, Jenna died of cancer, weighing only 35 kilos. The ambulance taking him to the hospital broke down, and for an hour he lay dying, parked on the roadside. Mountbatten later reflected that if he had known the seriousness of his illness, he might have delayed independence, and there may have been no partition. In October, Nehru came to Britain for discussions on the Commonwealth before going to the United States and New York. Dickie tactfully left the reunited lovers alone for a midnight rendezvous and route from the airport. Oh, so they are lovers. This is not just a, you know, meeting of the minds. Too lovely, Edwin noted in her diary. While Dickie initially stayed in London, the two spent several days at Broadlands, where Nehru entertained Patricia's sons by getting down on all fours in the drawing room and making lion faces at Norton and his new brother, Michael John, who roared back in absolute delight. Another generation of kids having to live in the shadow of this weird family dynamic. For the next week, they were inseparable. They visited Jacob Epstein's studio. Edwina joined Nehru on the platform at a meeting at Kingsway Hall. They saw Euripides' Medea jointly attended the Lord Mayor's Banquet, a reception at the King's Hall, and a dinner for Dominion P premieres at Buckingham Palace, and were photographed at a Greek restaurant in Soho after the press was tipped off by Krishna Menon. Bad looks. Bad looks all around. Just, it's it's so nasty, you know. I, it's nothing new for Edwina. It's nothing new for the public. They knew she was like this. But to be as old as she is, I'm not saying she has one foot in the grave, but she's mature. This, I mean, when are you going to put childish ways behind you? When, when are you going to stop looking for love in the arms of all of these men who are not your husband? At the end of October, the Mountbatten's returned to Malta, Nehru seeing them off from Northolt, and Edwina in dark glasses to hide her tears. Dickie, who had been appointed as commander of the first cruiser squadron, now reported to Admiral Sir Arthur Power, who insisted on continuing to call him Sir. It must have been a huge adjustment from having ruled a subcontinent to an island just over 300 square kilometers, from having given orders to now being a subordinate. Power, initially wary, grew to respect his new colleague. He wrote, We saw eye to eye on most important matters. I found him an endless source of entertainment with his peacock Montebagri, which kept popping up at unexpected moments in sharp contrast to his normal sane and statesmanlike person. By the end of my time with Mountbatten, I had reached the conclusion that, in spite of several failings, he was a great man and a statesman. He was dynamic, easy to deal with, and always open to argument with a tremendous gift of charm and inspired leadership. So that's, I think, why Dickie is such a complicated character, because he was so likable. And I think that it's really difficult to parse out when a person has moral and emotional failings when you like them so much. It, you just give them a pass on so many things. And because so many of his interactions with power, 
powerful people, he was being so likable that all of the rumors and the gossip and the, you know, you won't believe what Dickie did this time. If you knew him, you would just assume, but I'm sure he meant the right thing. You know, he might have bungled it a little bit because he was also very capable. I think that's the other thing. He was a very capable person, very on top of things. His ego certainly got in the way. And I think his ego drove him to do things that were wild and, and, uh, unwise, but because he was such a capable person overall, and because he was so likable, it would have just been really hard to parse out where his failings lay. Their old house, Casa Medina, had survived the war, but was now converted into flats. So they first stayed at the newly opened Phoenicia Hotel before moving shortly after Christmas across the road from the Casa Medina to a villa. Royal Marine Ron Perks was assigned as Mountbatten's driver and lived at the villa while it was being decorated. Perks would often drive Mountbatten to his scuba diving or to polo practice, where he spent hours practicing at a stationary horse in an enclosed area with the ball ricocheting around. You would be very relaxed with him. He never stood on ceremony, according to Perks. He recollected how once driving through a 40-mile-per-hour area, Mountbatten, who loved to drive fast, told him to step on it. Perks says, I explained about the speed restrictions, and he insisted we swap places, which we did. A few minutes later, the military police, who we called snowdrops on account of their white helmets, stopped us. After saluting me in the back, they proceeded to give the driver a bollocking until they realized who he was. And we then swapped places again, and I drove to our function. I always respect people who, in a situation where they could have power and where they could treat their servants or the people who work for them as less than or just sort of ignore them or just like get work out of them but not create any kind of relationship or bond. I always respect the people who see how dumb that is and who treat the people that they're working with as human beings. I'm not saying you need to overstep your bounds and, you know, these don't need to be your best friends, but to just sort of have a human relationship with these people, I'm always so refreshed by that. Why so Dickie threw himself into his new responsibilities, Edwina felt trapped. One feels one's brain and even one's energy shrinking to fit the island, she told Nehru. She continued to work for St. John Ambulance and Save the Children, and Pamela became a caseworker for the Soldiers, Sailors, Airmen Families Association. Eventually, she settled into a routine. You'll be pleased to hear that Edwina has been quite relaxed and very sweet, and we never have a cross word. More like 1928 than 1948, Dickie wrote to his mother, still telling Mummy everything that happens at his house. Still, I think it's a very good thing that we should have good long periods apart, for we have been on top of one another for too long. Yeah, what a weird relationship. Because, you know, most of us would be like, oh, it's so hard to be away from my spouse for so long. But these two don't function well together. They need their long times apart from each other. I mean, you know, they don't have a marriage. They don't. They are roommates who occasionally are intimate, maybe at this point. I don't even know what their intimacy level is. They consider themselves married. So maybe when there's no one else around, you know, They desperately find each other in the dark, but I think that the majority of their relationship was them hating having to be with the other person, having respect for the other person because of what they have accomplished in their careers and out of respect for what they sometimes have. But these are not people, I don't feel like, who had any business being together. It's just, it's just the weirdest relationship. Wesley was away on a winter cruise for January. Wesley was away on a winter cruise from January to April. Edwina returned to Britain, where Malcolm Sargent joined her at Broadlands, and she spent a night at Sandringham, quite the ugliest house I've ever seen, to see Philip and Elizabeth's new baby Charles. Charles. All the bucks are crossing over. She felt out of place, telling Nehru, I always feel most bogus in this kind of circle. I always feel I am going to say something which will surprise and shock them most terribly. Uh, sorry to pause yet one more time. These are the circles she's run in her whole life. And I feel like a lot of what she's writing is to make herself seem relatable to Nehru. To act like, oh, I had to go see the the princess and her husband. Ugh, see their new baby. It was, it's so hard because I'm just, I mean, I'm the sort of person that's just so like, well, you know, it's just like I'm always worried I'm going to say the wrong thing. Well, I mean, she definitely has run her life in a way that is shocking probably to most circles, especially to Elizabeth, who was so regal. But she never seemed to have a problem before. And I just feel like she is a sort of person who, in trying to relate to the person that she is most currently sleeping with or in relationship with, tries to make herself seem like the only place I'm happy is with when I'm with you. You know, I'm here, it's fine, whatever. I'm visiting royalty and seeing their you know, little baby. But 
oh, I'd be so much happier if I were with, with you. You can sell the other person that the only time you're happy is with them. That person needs to run away because you are a mental case. Surely you can be happy at some point when I'm not around. So you're either lying to me or you're crazy, but neither one of those are things I want to get involved with. Anyway, the book supports it by saying only in India did she now feel fully at home. In mid-February, she returned for five weeks, chaperoned by Pamela, to stay with Nehru. So she wants to go visit her boyfriend and her chaperone is her daughter. Somebody stop the crazy. She continued to tour refugee camps and hospitals, saw old friends, and visited refugee settlement projects. Nehru took her, Pamela, and various members of his family for four days to Orissa in eastern India, where the two lovers walked on the white sand at midnight and swam at dawn. In the third week of April, Nehru was back in Britain for a meeting of Commonwealth Prime Ministers, and after a meeting with Attlee and lunch with George VI, was immediately driven to Broadlands, where he stayed for the next two weekends. You've brought me all I was yearning for, she wrote to Nehru. Happiness, balance, misery even. But we know the reason, and we could not change it. And there is infinitely more power and purpose to life. These two people are so like high school. Like, it's us against the world. I'm only happy when I'm with you. Oh, it's just killing me so much. This misery that I can't be with you, but I wouldn't sacrifice it for anything. It's just killing me so much. We're just, oh, we're so mean to each other staying in this, but... I couldn't be without you. It's like complete under the world, okay? Like, especially at their age. You know, if they wanted to be this delusional and they were 17, you'd be like, well, you know, you remember your first love. But at this stage of the game, please pull it together. But deeply in love as she was, she knew her duty was to be with her husband. That did not make it any easier. Quite the contrary. She was feeling angry, trapped, and resentful and took it out on Dickie. Dickie has done everything he can to let her live how she wants to live. He has never put the kibosh on the crazy when he rightly could have and should have. He's let her wild out. And at the end of the day, it's never going to be enough. He thought that he was preserving the relationship by letting her do what she wanted. But all he's done is extend and kick the can down the road uh, to where she's going to be angry and mad at him anyway. He feared her wrath, so he gave her her way. Yet she's still angry, angry and wrathful, and he spent an entire existence with her where he's just elongated the tragedy. He should have seen in the very beginning, oh, this person doesn't want to be married to me. And I know it was a different time, and getting a divorce would have like ruined his political career. And so I understand for practical reasons why he stuck it out. you know. And I'm not at all saying, oh, you guys don't get along, just get a divorce. I'm not saying that at all. I, this isn't a marriage. I mean, wh whatever they're play acting here, they can call it a marriage. It's not a marriage. you know. Um, this thing should have been annulled pronto. This marriage needs to be dissolved. This was never a true marriage. Th these people entered in and then they just like, were like, oh, uh, is there a definition for marriage? Well, we don't, we don't follow it. So if they're not acting married, let's just move on. Y'all, y'all never were. It's all Dickie's fault that she's unhappy. In these moods, Dickie had no idea how to deal with her except to give in. A particularly furious row broke out in June 1949 after he told her of his promotion to vice admiral and fourth sea lord. He opened his heart to her. Although I did not do anything unkind intentionally, I fear that my own misery made me a poor companion and a thoughtless one who must have caused you pain. <sighs> oh, I can't take it anymore. Why is he such a pandering baby? Stand up. Get a backbone. He continues on. Believe me, darling, I never want to cause you any pain because I always have been and always will be far too fond of you for that. Who, who's buying the lie? Who, who, who needs to hear this? Who, who's sitting here lapping it up? She doesn't want to hear it. He doesn't want to say it. Why is he saying it? Why, why continue to play act like this? If I have avoided having talks with you, I am sure it is the subconscious wish to avoid another scene, which has hitherto followed my attempts to quote, have things out. When we had, when we had that row on the boat yesterday, I became so violently unhappy that I really felt physically sick and greedy as I usually am. I could eat no lunch, and talkative as I usually am, I could find nothing to say. Let me begin by criticizing myself. Has he ever stopped criticizing himself? I am terribly self-centered and rather conceited and full of the vain glory of uniforms and decorations. I am bad with women as a whole, and of course particularly bad with you, and I believe that early failures caused me to despise myself and to feel, perhaps without justification, that you shared this view of myself. Uh, not without justification. She certainly does hate him. And that's the reason this relationship isn't working, because she has no respect for him. He continues, Please believe me when I say that the one thing I've always looked for is complete family love and friendship. 
that love and friendship can grow and become the most vital thing in the lives of the four of us, provided we do not start trying to impose restrictions on one another or harbor unkind thoughts. It, it's too late to be trying to have this conversation. You know, the four of us can be happy family. Your girls are grown. One of them already has some kids. Okay. We could be a happy family. No, that ship has sailed, son. That's over. It's done. To say we don't need to start trying to impose restrictions on one another or harbor unkind thoughts. The entirety of your relationship has been both of you at one point or another trying to restrict the other. And it's all but unkind thoughts. They've been married for so long now. No one is going to be able to remake this. You know, you, you can't just sit down and be like, okay, the marriage we had before is over, but now we're going to begin again. Because he just said he can't have hard conversations with her because she's so vicious and ugly every time he tries to. So then he tries to write her a letter so he can get his thoughts out without her cutting him down and interrupting him. But, you know, what is she going to do with that? She doesn't want to change. She hates him. She wants to leave him. And at this point, you just have to wonder, why didn't he let her? Because his job is one in which it's it's not a demotion. He didn't do anything wrong, but it's like a pre-retirement job, I suppose. He can't necessarily compromise himself at this point. He's in charge of this tiny little island and he is, you know, subordinate to authority, which is not a role he played in before. What is he, you know, so it's, it's, it's not like he's going to really jeopardize that next step in life. He's, he's, you know, his career is de-escalating, you know, so he's past the crescendo and if, he, if ever there was a time to be like, all right, lady, there's the door. This was the time. But he continues in his letter to address Edwina's jealousy about his girlfriends. He says, as for Yola, we are all such friends that it is fun being together. But there are times when it's fun being alone. Just as you wept with disappointment when circumstances meant that I was going to be home the first evening that you and Neighbor were going to be together, I sometimes also feel like I'd like to be alone with Yola. I never minded your seeing Malcolm and Nehru alone, as you know what? So when he was going to be in his own home, the place that belongs to him, I mean, and Edwina, but they're home together and Nehru's coming over and he's, you know, hadn't made arrangements to stay somewhere else. And she openly wept with him that he was going to be around. But then when he wants to be with Yola, she's like, absolutely not. Who do you think that you are? How do you, how dare you go hang out with your girlfriend? But she can have this weep thon when he happens to be in the house when her boyfriends are coming over and she can't handle it. And she's like, I just want to be alone with them. It's been so long. I, I, I don't, you know, if the man was crazy by the end of his life, if he did things that were like, wow, that's really weird. Why would you do that? I, you know, I, I don't know the extent of his crazy and I'm not making excuse for, it, but I'm saying I, I, I can't, Im I cannot imagine being able to function like your brain worked when you had made so many concessions to reality all along. How at this stage in your life, are you even able to meet reality when you see it? You know? And so I, I think the guy is going to go on to do some crazy things in this book and I make no excuse for it, but because I think he should have told Edwina how it was in the beginning. Their marriage went off the rails because he's over here like a simpering baby. Please don't. I love you. I'm the worst. I know I'm the worst. I'm sorry. He never stood up for himself. He never had a backbone. The marriage is a sham. It's in a shambles. He lives with a complete and total witch. You keep saying it's her menopause. I cannot even imagine what his life was. It would be better for him, as Proverbs says, to go live on the corner of a rooftop than to exist in a house with this lady. Edwina has suggested they not meet in Cyprus when a ship docked. But she writes to him and says, but then the old, old miracle happened. You pressed my hand and caught my eye and gave me that divine smile, which I like to think that you give to no one else and which I can assure you I get from no one else and kissed the back of my hair and the old heart fluttered in the same ridiculous way in which it fluttered for 28 years ever since I first met you at that divine dance of the B Vanderbilts. And I realized that if you came to Cyprus in that mood, my mood would meet you more than halfway and we would have a wonderfully happy time. I can't begin to understand you guys. I can't. I, I Something is very dysregulated inside of her. For 28 years, it's been this push-pull relationship. And then the guy, he smiles at you in one way and he kisses you. And then it's like, I I'm yours forever. I never want to be with anybody else. I'll meet you in Malta. But then you know that as soon as they were actually together, I think she lives her life like reaching for fantasies. 
you know, trying to get to this imagined place, trying to get to that imagined place. And that's why she keeps having all these lovers. And I think even her relationship with her husband is this thing that she has um, romanticized and fantasized about, but the reality of living with another flawed human being means that your fantasy and your romanticizing about uh, it almost never comes to fruition the way you had thought it would or for an extended period of time. There could be pockets that are exactly like you imagined and seasons that are similar to what you had hoped for. But like to live 28 years with another flawed human being means that you're going to sometimes see a crack in the fantasy and she just can't seem to handle that. But then whenever she gets these little glimmers of um, what life could be with Dickie um, and these little glimmers of her fantasy, she runs right back to it as though this is going to be the time when the cistern won't run dry. How could you be so dumb at this age? I don't understand. I just don't. I know I said this last episode. I will say it again. How can two such accomplished people be so emotionally stupid? Well, they did meet up in Cyprus. Dickie writing to his mother that they had, quote, never had a happier 10 days than our time in Cyprus and Rhodes. Good for them. Uh, I'm so mystified by why he continues to write to his mom about him and his wife and all of their ups and downs, especially at this age. I mean, is she even able to read his letters? She must be like a thousand years old. In October, Nehru was back with Edwina at Broadlands. It was a relationship that suited them well. Politically, emotionally, and intellectually compatible, they drew support from each other. He brought her small exotic gifts, welcome in a Britain still in the grips of rationing, such as mangoes from India, cigarettes from Egypt, and cheese from Switzerland. But he brought much more. Where Dickie had been too gauche, busy or casually dismissive, he was a man with whom she felt comfortable and an equal, who respected her mind and who knew how to appeal to her feelings. She had been able to channel her love in the past to the animals or strangers, such as the sick, the disposed, or poor. Now she had found a soulmate. For Nehru, the lonely widower and public figure bowed down by the pressures of office, here was a woman who asked nothing of him, with whom he could relax and who brought long-lost domesticity. I just don't know why they don't just get married. I mean, obviously, it would be a, been the scandal, but since when did she care about causing a scandal? Like, she, little, she literally has never cared about causing a scandal. That's never been at the top of her priority list to avoid. So what's the deal? Each saw the relationship as pure, whether it was or not. I dislike vulgar stories and cheap books and films based on crude sex appeal, she wrote to him. I am even rather disgusted by them, and I know, in consequence, am thought sometimes to be rather boringly prudish. I don't think anybody ever looked at Edwina and was like, there's a prude for you. Is she reacted to them in this way because they mirror a time in her life that she wished she had not been so vulgar and cheap acting back when she was like running around, darting in and out of rooms while people are exposing themselves to her at dinner parties and she comes out laughing and cackling like it's the funniest thing in the whole world? Or is she trying to distance herself from that image in Nehru's mind in case he had ever heard tell that she was like that? You know, in her older age, does she is she really repulsed by it? Or is she, again, like I believe, trying to rebuild her image to fit Nehru's expectations? Anyway, she claims she's grossed out by it and disgusted by it. And that, you know, she's this big prude, you guys. I'm just like, I'm such a prude. Nobody, like everyone thinks I'm like kind of boring because of it. <laughs> like, stop trying to rewrite history. And then she says, I think I'm not interested in sex as sex, Edwina wrote to him. There must be so much more to it, beauty of spirit and form and in its conception. But I think you and I are in the minority. Yet another treasured bond. She is so in love with herself. And by the way, lady, you are interested in sex for sex, which is why you've had such a string of relationships with men. You know, it's not beauty, form, the spirit of the moment. Stop trying to intellectualize this thing that you are addicted to. You know, it, it's just, it's so much more than sex for me. It's about beauty. It's about the farm. Uh, it's about the piano. Shut up. No, it isn't. It's none of those things. You like it. Okay. And you use it to make yourself feel better. You know, so if you want to talk about the form of conception. That's that, that's the conception. I feel bad. I'm going to go and have sex with this person. Maybe that will make me feel better. Oh, that person didn't do it for me. That guy crossed the room. Let's go. You know, it's, it's, she used sex as a vehicle for making herself feel desired because she didn't know how to feel like she was worthy on her own. But, you know, I'm really annoyed and disgusted by the fact that she would take this relationship with Nehru as an opportunity to rebrand herself to herself. A few months later, she joined him in India, where she continued her work with the Refugee Relief and Rehabilitation Committee, which she had set up after partition, but also visited museums and galleries. 
He was so knowledgeable about his country's past, and on that trip, he brought Indian history and art alive for us, remembered Pamela Mountbatten. My mother seemed to flourish in his company, so happy and fulfilled in his presence. The Mountbatten's finances had been stretched with all the entertaining and travel in India, and they continued to give generously to charities, support family retainers, and live extravagantly. In Malta, they employed a staff of 19, including a butler, housekeeper, two housemaids, two cleaners, three cooks, six stewards, two drivers, and a valet, which Dickie thought was, quote, not too grossly overstaffed. It's like him and his wife and I think his daughter. I don't think she's left yet. I think it is grossly overstaffed, man. 19 people you're paying. Meanwhile, your finances are being stretched. What? I mean, housekeeper, two housemaids, two cleaners, three cooks. What are y'all eating? However, with the income tax and surtax, Edwina's trust income from her grandfather had dropped from 45,000 pounds in 1939 to 4,500 in 1948. That is a sizable drop. Let me read these numbers for you guys again. 45,000 pounds in 1939 to 4,500. She is literally making only a tenth of what she made before. Unable to touch capital, protected against unscrupulous husbands, her only option was a government bill to let her draw on capital. By March 1949, the Mountbatten Estate Bill had successfully gone through three readings in the House of Lords with no opposition, but it then encountered opposition after a press campaign orchestrated by Beaverbrook. The obvious solution was to bring in a bill that covered all women in her position, and the married woman restraint upon anticipation bill duly became law in November. From this point dates Beaverbrook's vendetta against Dickey, which was to last until the 1960s. I regard Mountbatten as the biggest menace to the empire, Beaverbrook told Tom Dryberg. He has perpetrated one outrage after another. He was responsible for the present position in Burma. His conduct in Malaya is indefensible. He damaged the Dutch suzerainty in Indonesia, thus weakening the whole Middle Eastern structure. He should never have been given power or authority. His view henceforth of the couple was, quote, Mountbatten is vain, not clever. The woman is clever and not vain. Uh, I don't know about anything to do with Edwina not being vain. I think that she is vain, but in a different way that is not as easily recognizable. But interestingly, though, this fight that they had was actually over a very private fight. Now, you'll recall from several chapters before that when Dickie was in India, he had an affair with a girl named Janie, Janie Lindsay. Janie Lindsay was married to Beaver Brook's son. And the opposition that Beaverbrook felt to Mountbatten was not necessarily over what he had done uh, in public, but what he had done in private. And he really wanted to nail uh, Mountbatten's reputation up for everybody to see. The book says that it was not just public opposition, but a very private fight. When Janie Lindsay, who had married Beaverbrook's son, wanted to make Mountbatten godfather of her first child, the press magnet refused. The Express journalist Graham McKenzie was tasked, quote, to dig up dirt on Mountbatten. Graham recalled how he was dispatched with a photographer to stake out a rural hideaway that Beaverbrook believed Mountbatten used when meeting his lovers. Graham and the photographer hid in a ditch for days observing Mountbatten's comings and goings, but they failed to come up with any juicy material. The book says that a series of critical articles by Sefton Delmer was suppressed by a contact within the Beaverbrook camp on grounds of inaccuracy in the early 1950s, but many others followed questioning Mountbatten's judgments on Dipe, Southeast Asia, and India. Finally, in 1953, Mountbatten, who had been collecting examples of his negative coverage, considered legal action, but was dissuaded by the lawyers and Peter Murphy. Nevertheless, he continued to be irritated by the feud. Michael Wardell, Edwina's former lover and an express journalist, was asked to intervene and reported back to Dickey with, quote, a statement signed by A.J. Cummings, an independent journalist of high reputation, that he had examined all the express cuttings on you and found them fair comment. I begged Max to see you personally, and I asked you to come around to Arlington House to talk to him, but you and Edwina both decided against this course. The book asks, what was really behind this animosity? One Beaverbrook biographer, Tom Dryberg, believed it was because Mountbatten had told Jean Norton to break a dinner engagement with the increasingly controlling Beaverbrook. Weissel another, A.J.P. Taylor, thought something about Mountbatten touched Beaverbrook on a raw nerve. Yet another biographer, Anne Chisholm, felt it was more than that. She wrote, George Malcolm Thomas reflected the view of people inside Express newspapers at the time when he said with confidence, though 45 years after the event, that the cause of the vendetta was personal. 
After Jean Norton's death in 1945 at her cottage on the Cherkley estate, Beaverbrook learned from her papers that while she was his mistress, she had also had an affair with Mountbatten. This coincided with the view of Edwina Mountbatten's friends who remembered an earlier time when both the Mountbatten marriage and the Beaverbrook-Norton relationship had been under strain and the two had seen much of one another. Ah, uh, yes, it's really very rarely what's happening in the outside. It's what's happening in the private lives that people are really reacting to. It is a view that was shared by Jean Norton's daughter, Sarah Baring, Mountbatten's goddaughter and confidant, and also Beaverbrook's daughter, Janet, who later wrote, quote, By far the most likely reason for their feud was that father found a stack of passionate love letters Lord Louis had written to Jean Norton. Yeah, that's obviously why they're not getting along. You know, it's got nothing to do with the way he handled India. But if you were having an affair and then you find out this guy was over there with your girl, you know, your little side piece, and he was over there helping himself too, that would have been maddening. But again, when you live a life like this, prepare to be an angry and annoyed most of the time because you are sowing the seeds for discontent every which way that you turn. Okay, the book's going to take a bit of a switch as we talk about Philip. Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, had joined the Mediterranean fleet in October of 1949 and for his first month stayed with the Mountbatten's, though there were tensions as the young naval officer fought to establish his independence from his controlling uncle. Shortly afterwards, Princess Elizabeth came to Malta for a month and she too stayed with the Mountbatten's while so their home was being prepared. Edwina, who gave up her room and instead took Dickie's bedroom, wrote, quote, It's lovely seeing her so radiant and leading a more or less human and normal existence for once. And I believe that it's well documented that this was some of the best times of her life. I think she said very clearly and, and uh, to others anyway, that she was very happy in Malta and really enjoyed that experience of being, you know, sort of like just another officer's wife. The young couple joined the Mountbatten's on picnics, on the naval barge, at the polo, and at various dances. In Malta, Mountbatten had taken up a new hobby of scuba diving with a harpoon gun and had introduced Philip to it, as well as polo. When asked whether he preferred polo or scuba diving, he paused for a moment before answering, Well, polo is only a game. <laughs> Elizabeth's views of the Mountbatten had been shaped as much by her mother, who distrusted them, as her father, who accepted them. Diggy's former chief of staff, Boy Browning, whom he had helped place as comptroller of Philip and Elizabeth's household, had warned a member of the royal party, quote, Remember, you've got Dicky. He'd always rather do something under the table than above. Yes, that is a very telling statement about Dicky, and I think very true. Um, I think that there was some pleasure that he derived from being able to get away with things that people didn't know he was doing. And I think that in some ways his controlling marriage made him feel that he needed to do things in secret as a way of feeling powerful. Dickie was anxious to know what she thought of him, as Philip had told him she had not liked him. But in Malta, the two warmed to each other. She had done a lot of good functions and had gone down wonderfully with everyone here, Dickie wrote to his mother. I'd never really known her before and have quite lost my heart to her. She's very sweet. In my word, she's kind and thoughtful for Philip. Mountbatten threw himself into his new job, making a point of entertaining extensively and going to sea every week, and, and he had quickly flown his flag in every ship in the squadron. He also continued to demonstrate that he played by his own rules. During an exercise against the larger home fleet, he smuggled a warrant telegraphist ashore with a radio transmitter who proceeded to report the movements of the enemy fleet. When complaints were made, he replied that, quote, when he played war, he played with no holds barred. His handling of ships also remained problematic. On one night exercise, he ordered the torpedoes to position to fire to port and then directed the ships in a circle so they would have destroyed each other. One young officer could not help exclaiming, The man's mad! Yeah, well, we've known that for quite a hot second. But consider who he lives with. His career, however, remained unaffected. In June 1949, he had been made a vice admiral, and the following spring, his time with the first cruiser squadron ended, and he was appointed to the Admiralty Board. Vice Admiral Mountbatten is most versatile and remarkable in ability and energy alike, began Power's final report. Ambitious and perhaps impetuous, but not rash. A tremendous, a tremendous asset to the service to which he is devoted. There were five sea lords on the Admiralty Board. The first headed the Navy. The second was responsible for personnel. The third handled the design and building of ships. The fifth was in charge of the Naval Air Service. Mountbatten, having hoped to be chosen to run personnel, was appointed the fourth sea lord and was responsible for stores and pay. The worst of the jobs. By anyone's estimation. He put on a brave face. 
Well, having blown off steam, he wrote to Patricia, let me tell you that if I am sent as fourth sea lord, I should go very humbly and loyally and do my best. I accepted to go back and take my chance at carving out a naval career, and I have such ludicrous self-confidence that I still think I can get to first sea lord. There was much that needed to be done. There were insufficient uniforms for the 150,000 reservists available for mobilization, and mine sweeping fleet was under-resourced, under and pay needed to be reviewed. Within a month, he had visited the five major naval depots and each office in the Biddling and Stores Department. Crucially, the job gave him added experience of the workings of Whitehall, which was to prove useful in his career. But tragedy is about to strike and everything's about to be busted up. In February of 1952, George VI died after the Mountbatten's annual visit to Sandringham. A real shock, wrote Edwina to Nehru. How fit we had found him shooting and walking in spite of intense cold and arctic winds. He and Dicky had been close since their time at Cambridge together 30 years earlier and had corresponded on a regular basis. Dicky had always been scrupulous about keeping the sovereign informed and making him feel important. He had also never been reluctant to use the king's wishes to secure his own objectives. As at the state of George's reign, Dicky pushed himself forward to make himself indispensable according to one's point of view. Well, that was probably true. He probably did do that. I mean... Dickie's always been looking for a way to step up the next rung of society. It's just the way he views the world. Um, I don't know, even at this point, if he does it to be calculating and shrewd and deceptive and manipulative. I think that's just the way he thinks it's best to live life. Together with Churchill and the Duke of Gloucester, it was the Mountbatten's who met Elizabeth when she returned to Britain from a tour to Kenya as queen on February 7th. At the funeral, he had asked if he could walk immediately behind the coffin, as his father had at the funeral of Edward VII, until rebuffed by the Earl Marshal, the Duke of Norfolk, who was in charge of the arrangements. The young queen did so instead. As well she should have, and I think that for him to be trying to push forward and be like, hey, can I, um, like, my dad had this honor, can I have it too? Like, it's not about you. Why don't you be quiet? Why don't you just wait for them to tell you what to do? That's very distasteful. For Dickey, the new regime signified the triumph of the House of Mountbatten, and at a dinner at Broadlands, the day after the funeral, he gave such a toast. One of the guests, Prince Ernst of Hanover, reported to Queen Mary, who complained to Winston Churchill, pointed out that George V, in 1917, had decreed the House of Windsor to be the royal family's name forever. Churchill immediately called the cabinet meeting to discuss, aware that public opinion, so soon after two wars against the Germans, would be against such a link. No one quite knew the position given the Queen's married name was Mountbatten and a new decree had to be made in April re-emphasizing the position. Philip is furious that he could not pass on his own name to his children. It would be disappointing. It would be upsetting. It would be, it would feel like a complete reversal of everything you had known as for a man in Western culture. I mean, that's the whole deal. You pass on your name to your children. Even so, there were continued concerns about Mountbatten's Bengali influence over the royal family and his left-wing views. Philip and Elizabeth were regular guests at Broadlands, and there were rumors that he was plotting to have Philip made king consort. When the Duke of Windsor was over his brother's funeral, he noted of Mountbatten that, quote, one can't pin much on him, but he's very bossy and never stops talking. All are suspicious and watching his influence on Philip. It's a different tone from old, you know, Edward that we have not gotten, at least from this book. Mountbatten and the Duke of Windsor had been good friends when they were younger, and I think they kept in touch mostly because Dickie saw that um, for a time it would have benefited him to know the Duke of Windsor, but then as Edward's star began to dim and people began to see him as sort of this like little boy who clung to the hand of his mistress all the time, Dickie certainly distanced himself, but he'll show back up. Once the Duke of Windsor dies, Dickie's going to be all up in that mess. Anyway, the book goes on to say that Dickie wrote to Edwina in February of 1952. He said, four different people have come to me in the last two or three days to say that London is buzzing with rumors and talk in the clubs, etc., that I was to be offered an immediate post abroad so as to remove me from being able to influence Lilibet through Philip. My own influence was viewed with apprehension, and there was also the view that I would be passing on extreme left-wing views from you. Of course, you always tell me that I am very right-wing and reactionary compared with you. The book goes on to say that the reason for the gossip was an article in an American newsletter, the Bulletin of the International Services of Information, run by former intelligence officer Ulysses Amos, under the headline, A Red Aura Hangs Over the Mountbatten's, which, amongst many claims, accused Peter Murphy, a strong influence on the couple, of being a member of the Communist Party. Wasn't he? 
It was insufficient for MI5 to conduct an investigation into Murphy and raise their concerns with Mountbatten himself. The FBI also investigated and deemed Amos a nutter, but this was just the sort of attention that a senior naval officer did not need. The Mountbatten's politics were complex. As a serving naval officer and member of the Rell family, Dickey always claimed to try and stay above party politics, although he had to be rebuked at one stage by the First Lord of Admiralty. There's a feeling that in some of your conversations, you've approached rather too close to the dividing line between legitimate naval interests and foreign policy, he was told. He was a technocrat, keen to get things done, and a pragmatist, but he was also a progressive when it came to national aspirations, and his record in India had aroused suspicion in right-wing quarters. Edwina's politics were certainly to the left of his. Dining with Edwina in September of 1944, Chips Channon wrote in his diary, However politically, she talked tripe and pretended to be against all monarchy, who she is cousin to every monarch on earth. According to her, they must all be abolished. How easy it seems for a semi-royal millionaire who has exhausted all the pleasures of money and position to turn almost communist. (laughs) What a scathing and yet true line. My mother was genuinely left-wing and my father would try and persuade her only to argue with those that she could influence and not die hard admirals. But that was, of course, much more fun, remembered her daughter Pamela. She worked with Jeannie Lee in the Labour government. Several times people said that they had been persuaded to vote conservative after being charmed by her on the assumption she was a conservative. She was very annoyed. Her travels in humanitarian work had opened her eyes to the suffering in the world and the failure of governments to properly address it. Idealistic, perhaps politically naive, she was deeply critical of American foreign policy in Britain's post-war colonial policy, especially in Malaya and in East Africa. On the day before the coronation, tensions between her and government ministers came to a head at a lunch at Buckingham Palace, when she, Nehru, and Oliver Littleton, the colonial secretary, got into an argument about British policing in Kenya. It was sufficiently heated for Littleton to complain to the cabinet and for Mountbatten to receive a letter from the First Lord of the Admiralty that it would be prudent for her not to accompany him on a forthcoming official trip to Turkey. Edwina, who planned to visit hospitals and universities on the trip, was incandescent. Well, but she brought it on herself because she's interjecting herself in conversations that she doesn't need to, considering the position of her husband. If she wants to stay married to him and she continues to tell Nehru, I can't abandon you, I have to stay married to my husband, then she needs not to interject herself in scenarios that don't involve her if marriage to him is somehow so important for both of their careers that she has to stay in a place where she's unhappy, you know? So if you stay in a place you're unhappy because your career depends on it and his career depends on it, why are you reacting in public and having Having these big political fights. Of course, there's going to be consequences to that because you couldn't keep your mouth shut. After letters to the First Lord and Foreign Secretary giving her own version of the conversation, the Admiralty relented, but Edwina was to provide a convenient whipping boy for Dickie's enemies for years to come. Well, I think both people in this marriage have a lot to account for. I think that Neither one of them knew how to behave in any conceivable way, the way adults would behave. I think that both of them had had every advantage growing up, and so they were already extremely well-connected. So I think that because they hadn't necessarily had to fight and claw to get to the top, um, they just assumed that they can act however they want. There's like this sense of entitlement. Um, and it doesn't come out necessarily in their work ethics. They're both very hard workers, but it comes out in the way that they handle emotions. Like they just feel very entitled to the way they're going to feel and everybody better get out of their way. And this is how they feel. And you're going to have to somehow figure it out on your end. I'm going to go do me and you do you. And you know, you better never bump up against me. And, and if you do, I'm gonna have a royal fit about it. And our marriage is going to be a mess and our kids' worlds is going to be rocked. But, you know, I mean, like, that's just how it's going to have to be because I'm going to have my rights. I think that that's why they are so career accomplished because they already started so high up. Um, They already knew so many people that, but for a little networking, it was pretty easy to get where they wanted to go. They're both hardworking and they both knew a lot of people. That's a recipe for getting what you want to, if you want to be the top of the ladder, you know, you have all the ingredients. They're just so emotionally immature, especially when it comes to romantic love and to faithful relationships. They don't seem like they know how to do that part. Anyway, that was that reading. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, This coming week, if you're following our Kennedy book, we're going to be doing Jackie Kennedy this week. And then, of course, next Sunday, we will have another chapter of the Mountbatten's. It was good talking and I'll see you guys later. Bye.